Hello, Professor Rickles. Welcome back to Tatpadi. Hello again. Yeah. So uh, where we left off last time was uh, you you shared with us what the existence of the quantum world means to you personally. And there were some really interesting thoughts you had shared. So we'll just pick up uh, from where we left. I have a new question. Mm. So uh, what I wanted to know from you is uh, what would you say are some of the aspects of the quantum world that have strongly and directly you know, kind of challenged our well-worn sensibilities? Well, the, I suppose the main one is what we were kind of talking about at the end of the last conversation, which is that it seems to show us that the idea of, of an objectively existing world out there mm -hmm. doesn't quite make sense. Mm -hmm. So it, it's the idea that there is, in some sense, we, that we are required by our measurements mm -hmm. to bring about the objectivity of the world, mm -hmm. without which it doesn't have any kind of properties or attributes or states. And there's a whole bunch of um, um, experimental um, results that seem to indicate this. It's not just sort of philosophers talking rubbish. There's, you know, we have theorems, mathematical theorems, like the Cork and Specker theorem, Bell's theorem, that seem to show that it's, you, you can't, without letting some assumptions go, you can't speak of there being a real objective world sitting out there that doesn't care about us and measurements and things like that and observers. I right. suppose that's the key one. The other one is of course, the existence of um, what look like genuinely chancy indeterministic events. So whenever we do put a question to the world and say, you know, ask an electron whether it's spin up or spin down, mm -hmm. put it for this machine that has a magnetic field and it can either be deflected up or it can be deflected down. Mm -hmm. um, we have no way of knowing which one it's going to be. We can only talk about probabilities of outcomes. Mm -hmm. So we can say, well, it's going to be 50 50. We can mm -hmm. talk about the distribution, the statistics of it, but we can't say which one it's going to be in this particular experiment, which is obviously a, a, a massive break as well from um, classical physics. Because usually, when you, if you're using statistics in classical physics, it's because of your knowledge because you're, you're ignorant of some, you know, um, some feature of the system. And if only you knew it, then you would be able to predict with certainty. So for example, a, a, you know, a coin mm. or a dice, mm. um, in principle, classically, you could be able, you would be able to say which side it's going to land on heads or tails mm. by cal calculating the, you know, the exact trajectory of the coins and the any dust particles that deflect it. You can do it in principle, it's just that it's very complex. Mm -hmm. But it seems that quantum mechanics, the statistics there are beyond complexity. There's a fundamental um, indeterminism right. in quantum mechanics. Right, do you think with time and um, uh, say changes in the way we look at things, we could come to understand it a little better than the way we do now, make it a little more, for the lack of a better word, deterministic? Uh, I don't know. I mean, there are people that work on these things called hidden variables uh -huh. theories, which make it deterministic. So you are not forced into um, thinking that the theory is deterministic, uh, indeterministic. Okay. So um, if you're an Everettian, for example, if you believe in many worlds interpretation of quantum right. mechanics, right according to which whenever there is a decision that has to be made by the world right. because of our measurements, mm -hmm. the world, there's a branching. Um, if you believe that, then all of those outcomes are happening. Mm -hmm. So there's no case of it's either heads or tails. It's always both heads and tails. Mm -hmm. And it's determined fully um, deterministically by this thing called the Schrodinger equation, the central equation of quantum mechanics. So there's no indeterminism. The only indeterminism then becomes related to us because the idea is we don't know which branch we're going to be on. Mm -hmm. We don't know which, you know, which branch our consciousness is going to be evolving along. So it becomes a subjective matter rather than an objective matter. A matter of choice? Is... A matter of choice? It's not a matter of choice. It's a matter of um, it's purely subjective probabilities that we're dealing with. 
because okay. the, in many worlds everything happens mm -hmm. there's no there's, there's literally no outcomes the, the cat is alive and the cat is dead in the schrodinger's cat example mm -hmm. so there's no sense of talking about the probability of one or the other it's mm -hmm. always both but obviously our experience conflicts right. with that we only ever see one or the other yeah so, the, so that's the paradox it's solved by saying okay we only ever see one or another because our um we don't know which um branch our consciousness is going to be along mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's a subjective matter and we mm -hmm. have to sort of any probabilities we assign are um, not about the world we're not making statements about the world mm. we're making statements about our knowledge of the world right so it's an epistemic form of of probability right rather than an ontological one yeah so uh th there is something uh i wanted to understand also about uh about this specifically from you so physics is generally uh led by evidence you know there is uh a thing like you said if it stays invariant over a period of time it becomes true you know, because it hasn't changed, it's robust. But what about belief? So because these are people doing things, these are people conducting experiments, these are people conducting observations, and yes, and they're very uh, careful in what they do. But what about their own personal beliefs that physicists bring into, uh, into their work? Have you been able to see the, the role that plays, your belief in a certain thing? Like, yeah. Um. Well, I mean, this is more the realm of, um, I would say, probably even sociology of science rather than philosophy of science. So, so sociologists of science are concerned with why scientists study the things they do, why they go down the particular routes of mm. research that they do, and why, if there's a choice, an apparent choice of possible um, ways of interpreting something, why they go down a particular um, interpretive path as well. Because speaking of evidence, I mean, I mean what, this, what quantum mechanics situation shows us very clearly mm. is that the evidence isn't sufficient to determine um, a picture of reality, right? So we can all agree on the evidence of quantum mechanics, right? Mm -hmm. There are these experiments. Mm -hmm. Um, involving sort of double slits and we get the and we can write them down on the paper and, can, and we can agree that okay this is what happened there was a click in the machine here right. there was two clicks in the machine here or whatever we all agree on those bits mm -hmm. and we can all agree on the mathematical formalism on how we can predict what's going to happen in these experiments in terms of clicks on a screen or something like that um, what we can't do is determine the ontological picture of reality that that mathematical formalism and those experimental clicks and blips and whatever mm. are going to um, lead to because we've just seen in the many worlds interpretation mm. we have a world that's deterministic mm -hmm. but in the standards sort of what's called the copenhagen interpretation mm -hmm. it's indeterministic mm -hmm. so we've got the same source mm -hmm. of evidence mm -hmm. the same mathematical framework and an absolutely completely different physical picture of reality one deterministic, one in indeterministic. And I think we were talking the last time about how often um, it seems to be something to do with the physicist's personalities mm -hmm. that lead them down certain paths. And we were talking about cyclic cosmologies at the time. Yeah. Um, and the, the data there can't determine, you know, that there's not sufficient data to say that our universe is cyclic that's something coming from the from the physicists and i think in the same way the choices that are being made with respect to a particular interpretation of quantum mechanics have to do with the physicists as well in a very similar way right right it's it's because it's not the data and it's not evidence so it has to be something else so it's either sociology or psychology yeah so right. sociology some so sociologists often study um this sort of um group formation right why why does a consensus form mm -hmm. and um so for example in string theory there was a there was a period where it was considered that string theory is the only possibility if you want to solve the problem of quantum gravity mm -hmm. and this group formed basically and the idea is that it, it becomes um there's almost like a sort of pulling effect that pulls people in 
to this particular way of doing things because of the group dynamics and because of the profession even. If you want to get a job, you've got to study a particular way of doing it because this is the, the fashion. So that's the sort of sociological explanation for why people choose to do something. But then there's the psychological explanation, which is that they might be sort of free thinking kind of people. They might have a religious background or they might have some, some other ideas about how reality should be. And therefore they choose the one, the interpretation, maybe indeterministic or local or something like that, that suits their package of beliefs that they have. Right. Very so it's true. Yeah, I mean, so it's absolutely true that it plays a far greater role than people usually think. Right. The package of beliefs that you have. Right. People think it's just evidence and data and, you know, science is just, you know, inev we're inevitably led down certain paths, but it's not true at all. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I agree with that, yes. And, um, yeah, so you shared your uh, book with me, which is coming out in October, and I... And I've read through most of it. Like, I think I've almost read like three fourths of the book. And it's it's written in a way that can be understood, I think, by a, a lot of people. Life is short. And uh, what I wanted to ask you is, since your book is about making life meaningful because life is short, would you say that a thing inherently has meaning? Or is it um, always that we give meaning to a thing? And then, then there's another part to it. If you can tell us what does giving meaning to something mean to you? And uh, if there are any tools or insights you can share with us in order to give meaning to something, because that seems to be valuable as, as you have uh, put forth in your book. Yeah, I mean, so that was the, so the point of that book was to show that the shortness of life is what is ultimately at the root of um, meaning. The, meaning, the meaning of life, basically. So the idea is, and it relates even to this physics, the, the stuff we were just talking about exactly. in determinism, yeah. actually. Um, the idea is if you've got um, a finite um, amount of time, mm. then you are forced to make choices. Mm. Right? If you don't have finite time, then everything is possible and you can choose, you can do everything ultimately. If you've got a finite amount of time, then you are restricted in what you can do. Mm. Um, so the idea is that those, um, when you're faced with a choice or a crisis point, you are forced to make a decision. Mm. And when you make that decision, you are carving um, a particular path yeah. um, through a, a kind of possibility space. Mm. Uh, and it's almost like a creative act. So this is where the, um, the indeterminism bit comes in. So the universe doesn't know what's going to happen ahead of time on the account I give in the book. Mm. There's, a, there's a genuine indeterminism in the world. Mm -hmm. The universe doesn't know what is going to happen in the next step because there's freedom of will. Mm. We, we're, we're free to make um, choices. Mm. And those choices will determine which way the, the universe goes, what its next step is. Right. So the idea is that that sort of... Um, power that we have in determining how the universe is going to go mm -hmm. into the future precisely what gives life a meaning we're sort of co-creators in how the universe evolves into the future and in order to have that as a possibility you need real possibility genuine possibility in the universe mm -hmm. to have genuine possibility in the universe it can't be deterministic so it's sort of calling on some of these ideas that we were talking about um, when we were talking about Wheeler and the chaos dragon and all of that kind of stuff that we were talking about you you need this um uh, the future needs to be open basically mm. and then our choices will determine um, these kind of things and that and you can find this in quantum mechanics so if there's no objective way the world is out there well it requires us to objectify it mm. so that's what i mean by meaning it's where the subject and the object align mm. So that's kind of a standard notion of me of meaning in philosophy, where you've got a subject somehow related to an object. Mm -hmm. So, but I think there's something a little bit deeper happening, where the meaning is, I don't know, the meaning is somehow being formed by the this co-creation that's going on between the the subject and object, but it's a little bit before. 
so it's very hard to I, there's a um another the other book i i don't know if i sent you it the other book that i wrote with harold atmansbacker um no. on dual, dual aspect monism and the deep structure of meaning mm, no, no, no. basically mm. deals with exactly with this point but it's a book length um description so it's quite hard to explain without going through examples i understand but, um i understand but that yeah, but like if, if if general general people, right? If uh, oh, how, since you've been contemplating this idea of meaning, and uh, I would say it's it, the book that you've written, the one that I've read, Life Is Short. It it obviously uh, to some extent must have confronted you with your own mortality, like really thinking about it. Like one day, that's it, you know. Uh, yeah, and but until then, you know, you're you're. You, until then you go on and you uh, the, how you go on is by finding meaning in everything you do right because for you you found some inherently something useful in that for the lack of a better word something practical in that right and perhaps you also have a in that sense maybe you see your social responsibility as well like okay if i live a meaningful life uh, but that could mean not hurting somebody that could mean following my passion so you leave a legacy or something behind which you're children might follow which your students might follow you know people you get in touch with might follow and if it has been good in some sense i don't know what that means is it good for you so it has meaning or is it good because what is what is good then how are um, we how do we how do we say meaning how does a regular man who is not nihilistic but let's say just lost yeah well, that's what the book is supposed to sort of address is precisely mm. that so usually when people speak of the meaning of life they go outside of life and they start talking about transcendent things or some meaning beyond life so the, mm. there's this famous book by Viktor Frankl right where he's um he's in Auschwitz and he's an Auschwitz survivor and he's the reason how he copes with it is because he sees that there's a transcendent order beyond that he's mm. part of but that's not very good for most people most of us don't have Auschwitz type experiences we're just ordinary people so the idea was to have something more sort of um realistic and within the world that we that we all um uh that we all can um participate in which is um we all have freedom of choice mm. basically mm. we can all make um uh, and our choices will determine how things evolve into the future and it can determine how I mean, you you mentioned whether it's good. I mean, in this case, I don't know how you would solve sort of big problems with the environment um, and population and humanity if you don't have something like this kind of viewpoint. So what's weird about how things are presented at the moment is, okay, humanity is in peril, but we are just machines, basically. There's, we're just material beings. That are just guided by the laws of physics now that's two inconsistent um things like if you, if you accept both of those then there's nothing we can do about it okay so humanity's in peril and we're machines well we have no way of resolving things mm. but if humanity is in peril and we are sort of responsible for determining how the universe goes mm. well then we can do something about it so if mm. you sort of instill in people this idea that they have freedom of choice and that freedom of choice can have dramatic consequences mm. well then you sort of get solutions to world problems as well as getting some meaning out of it as well you're and sort of responsible for yeah yeah and personal problems you are responsible for building your future and whether it goes well or bad is your responsibility mm. so i mean part of the problem is most people don't like that idea they sort of want to want to be taken care of but then there's not much meaning in that kind of life where you're being taken care of mm. if you're not having to sort of battle yourself to create something it's almost kind of like work right right often i think i mentioned in the book um that um cg young mm. um refers to work as a solution to these sort of the problems the modern man's problems and the general malaise that uh, modern human beings find themselves mm. in in that they don't want to um restrict themselves they want to keep all their options open and but there's no meaning in that. So that his solution is just to do something constructive and creative like work, just so you're doing something real and making choices and forging something. Right. So uh, 
So, so another thing that I'm seeing here is that uh, because we are limited, there is meaning to life. And if, uh, I mean, if our time is limited, if we were immortal, if we were immortal. Now, here is a scenario. We've only experienced the opposite of it, which we've only experienced a limited amount of time. So it is in some sense open to imagination. Like we can, we mm-hmm. cannot say like uh, what immortality would look like. Say, for example, because people have walked down this road and, you, you know, try to come up with some interesting ways of how how we would inter- interpret immortality. So, for example, there is this film. It's called uh, The Man from Earth. Now, this is, a, I don't know if you've heard of this film. Man from Earth. Okay. No. So uh, in this, what happens is, it's a very interesting story about a man who's about uh, 14,000 years old. And so he survived okay. generations. He survived a lot of, uh, uh, you know, all this time that has passed. And he's managed to not age beyond 35. Well, that's the quirk in his mm-hmm. immune. Something has happened and he's not managed to uh, go beyond it. So he's still young. And some of the people that he's talking to think that uh, if you haven't uh, died and you are a caveman, you would continue to be a caveman. But he is shown he's actually a professor. And so, Mm -hmm. you know, so he has evolved with ages. He evolved with time. So in some sense, he did find meaning, even if it was just protecting himself because he wasn't dying. People were afraid of him, trying to get rid of him, whatever it was. So even though he's an immortal, he managed to find time. So in... Uh, so we do not know what immortality would look like for us, right? But what right now we have with us is our mortality. And it is useful to find meaning in that, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, one of the things, I, so I have a chapter on this in the book, actually. Um, yeah. I mean, one, of, one, of the, one of the difficult things about thinking about immortality is that it's, it's difficult to see whether you would have one and the same being over that kind of life, lifespan or whether it even makes sense to speak of the same um, Identity. persisting self mm. or because yeah. it starts to look because you change so much yeah. um, even in one lifetime even in our lifetime yeah. if you imagine thought 14,000 years it looks like a series of disconnected um, selves basically eventually so it's hard to hard to speak of one and the same individual being immortal rather than a series of overlapping selves which is, I mean, this was, um, Plato discussed this when he was talking, thinking about the uh, metempsychosis and the transmigration of souls. Mm. Okay, so it used to be thought that um, it was like a standard view that mm. humans are immortal, right? There's a, and so the idea was that philosophy trains you to disconnect from the body and then the soul goes on to incarnate in some other body. But like, in what sense does it, it's, it's sort of hard to think of that model as, immortality because each time it incarnates it sort of becomes a different a different self Mm -hmm. so there's an immortal soul but different selves in these scenarios Mm -hmm. and i think something similar would probably be the case with this fourteen thousand year um example as well Mm -hmm. and fourteen thousand years is very different from eternity (laughs) as well i would say so fourteen thousand years i could maybe imagine filling 14,000 years with things, mm. but, but filling eternity. eternity eternity with things. I mean, you really would start going, doing the same thing multiple times. You'd do the same thing infinitely many times eventually yeah. and have an eternal cycle of all possible things. Right. So then you've literally done everything, right? You've done everything infinitely many times if you are literally immortal. And then where's the meaning in that? Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. So, uh, yeah, I also wanted to ask you, I have a few questions on, on time, like what understanding does a physicist bring into the world about time? And what would you say a philosopher of physics uh, brings into the world the understanding of what time is? Yeah, um, well, I mean, if, obviously if a physicist is mostly concerned with um, having a, a notion of time that is physically realizable and that can be agreed on by other physicists mm-hmm. so that they can all agree that this amount of time has lapsed. Mm-hmm. So they need a notion of duration, basically. That's the key feature. And they need to all agree on it. So for that, you need a, a clock. So basically time for a physicist means a clock that is mm-hmm. registering events and registering the duration event of events 
when events are simultaneous and when they're not simultaneous. Mm. Um, so they they need a clock, but mm. it's quite hard actually to pin down um, in terms of physics what a good clock is because in order to speak of um, durations, well, you would need to compare it mm -hmm. to another clock, mm -hmm. but um, you don't know whether you've got a good clock or a bad clock. Mm -hmm. So you don't know which one is the good one and which one is the bad one. You can only compare clocks. So mm -hmm. you can never quite settle on how it, because you don't have any absolute notion of duration. We can only get a notion of duration by comparing it to physical processes. Mm -hmm. So we're always in this weird kind of loopy bootstrap situation where we have to assume a good clock in order to measure events in the world. And then we can even use those events in the world to, de to define what we mean by a clock. So usually we use like processes like the rotation of um, the earth, um, the orbits of um, the earth around the sun and so on in order to generate our notions of time. And then we divide mm. them up. Problem is we know that those processes, all physical processes like that mm. have slight errors. Sure. So the Earth's rotation is slowing down a bit. So if we want really high precision, then we have to go to things like um, atomic clocks mm -hmm. and use sort of the, um, the oscillations of atoms, cesium-133 atom is what we use, okay. to define what we mean by second, so we can all agree on it. So you have to find something universal that mm -hmm. somebody can create in a laboratory anywhere in the world or in the universe mm -hmm. in order to redefine what a second means. So that they can set up a clock. Mm. So that's a physicist version of a clock, and they don't go that much beyond um, that notion of a clock. Obviously, if a um, philosopher is then going to ask, well, okay, is there something in the world that that clock is measuring, or is it just that we're setting up correlations between what we want to observe in a laboratory and this clock on the wall here? Because mm. usually physics is about correlations between things we observe in a laboratory and some kind of system of reference, a clock mm. and, a, and, a, and a room, a laboratory. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't necessarily mean that there's something in the world that the clock is measuring, right? That there's some sort of beat in the universe that the clock is latching onto. So if a philosopher wants to know whether there's something in, out there mm -hmm. that is being measured by our watches, right, or whether it's just some conventional system that we've invented in order to with. speak and measure things yeah yeah and uh, so now that you've been studying time as a philosopher right i'm right in saying that yeah the meaning of time what time means um mostly what whether what physicists say about time and space is true and necessary actually yeah so it's no what, like, yeah Go on, please. Yeah, I mean, so in some in the early work that I was looking at, I would look at um, quantum gravity because quantum gravity is constantly saying things like time doesn't really exist mm -hmm. in reality. Mm -hmm. It's emergent from something non-spatio-temporal. We spoke a little bit about this before. Mm -hmm. And then the question is, well, I don't know, does that actually make sense? Can you have a world in which there is no such thing as time at a fundamental level does it, is it even a coherent possibility because it seems like if you're talking about sort of the empirical world you need space and time it's almost like a kantian condition of having a experience of a world that it's temporal and spatial mm -hmm. and to have things you know objects and things in the world they seem to be it seems to require being at a time and at a certain bit of space in order to make sense of them. So a lot of my early work was looking at the um, what it actually means to say that quantum gravity has no time. And then eventually um, what I showed was that the time has to be uh, inherently relational. So it, there's time in there, even though they say time is not real in quantum gravity, what they mean is it's not an absolute parameter. It's not something that's absolutely existing in the world, independently of what we do. It's something that we have to set up using correlations, as I said earlier. So time is basically a system of correlations yeah. between systems. Yeah, like for, for us, for, for just general people, time is like 
when you look, when you do things, when, right? When you do things, it can go on to for how long, for or for how little, and this is where it ends, and it makes sense. And people have built up their lives totally around uh, this idea of, of of time. Maybe it's a is it an intuitive way of looking at time? And uh, if this is an intuitive way of looking at time, uh, I, it'll be nice to know if, as a philosopher now. Is your intuitive way of looking at time kind of uh, in conflict with whatever it is that you've come to understand about time because of the way you've been studying it now for a period of time for a period of time yeah uh yeah so that so the everyday view of time is not very far from the physicist's view of time right but it's mm -hmm. just you know time as you say it's sort of um it's numbers on clocks mm. telling you when to do certain things and when to meet somebody and how long to do a certain thing for you don't in everyday life view time as something weird and sort of out there in the world beating away independently of the clocks time is just clocks basically mm. and um so my um current view of what time is is completely in contrast to that so in the book I mentioned earlier, this dual aspect monism and the deep structure of meaning, um, the idea is that space and time don't exist at a fundamental level. And that there's instead a something that is neutral. It's non-spatio-temporal. It's neutral with respect to mind and matter. Mm -hmm. And it's essentially this abs the absolute. It's an mm -hmm. unconditioned reality. Mm -hmm. And time emerges um, oh from this. Mm -hmm having to do with the correlations between mind and matter it's an emergent feature so the, um, it, it, likewise it, it, space. yeah so if space and time are emergent usually in physics uh, it's all about interactions and this fundamental thing being nothing at all or at least nothing that we're able to describe so far yeah. we lack the let's say the the, the 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 vocabulary and that means to some sense our understanding to explain it so then what is interacting for this to emerge I, I would say it's not that we lack the vocabulary. I would say it's beyond vocabulary. So a vocabulary implies things, mm -hmm. that there are objects, entities. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, in this view, is that entities and things are um, things that are manifested by this unmanifested deeper um, domain, if you want to call it that. So you, you, it's ineffable. You can't you can't really talk about it because in talking about it you have to make it a thing but as soon as you make it a thing you generate this split between subject and object mm. you're objectifying yeah. it but to objectify it you need a subject against which it's set against it's reflecting right. it right so you right. If you bring it thinghood and then you've automatically gotten away from the from its unconditioned absolute nature right right and and and, so and time. yeah yeah you, you go no no i was just saying that i think this again in stories through stories i've come to uh, observe these things because time has been under contemplation space has been under contemplation different worlds multi worlds have been under contemplation and people have taken different roads of thought so one is that the split is necessary for meaning to happen in the sense like to understand what it, it this ineffable thing is for it to understand mm -hmm. itself it had to split mm -hmm right that, yes, because otherwise it otherwise it need not yeah but i mean the but what's problematic about that is so you have to do that i think in order to um think in terms of knowledge gaining knowledge of something but you're always stepping away from it when you do that yes right so you're never quite doing the thing that you want to do if you want to understand the nature of this absolute you always have to split it but thereby you are sort of negating the thing that you're trying to do yeah and but that's the only way to do it right if the split only if the There's split no happens way, yeah. there is no other way so we, our understanding will always be incomplete is what you are saying yes that's basically it yeah. that's basically it um so one of the other projects i have underway at the moment relates quite heavily to this business of um of the absolute and this incompleteness with trying to know everything um, and it's a it's a project on why there's something rather than nothing, mm -hmm. why existence, mm -hmm. and it's called Wandering Mazes Lost. What what and is it called? You know, sorry, uh, Wandering Mazes Lost, which was um, so William James has this 
has a, a discussion of this problem of why existence, right? Why do we have existence when it looks like there could be nothing as a possibility? And he says that when we sort of discussing this problem, it's like being in a labyrinth and we're just stuck in the maze and we can never quite get out of it, which is very similar to this idea of when we're trying to describe the universe, the absolute, we always have to somehow um, modify it in such a way that we can never solve the problem we're trying to solve in the first place. So it's like the maze is always moving and shifting around as we're trying to get out of it. So the project is basically um, trying to study how that question has been asked and resolved from the beginnings, from the Rig Veda, in fact. So there's a hymn, hymn of creation in Rig Veda mm -hmm. where it's kind of saying, from whence did this creation, manifold of creation spring? And, and it goes into the primeval waters giving birth to you know multiplicity and these kind of things. So it's sort of tracing, um, seeing if there's some um, idea that goes through the whole of the history. And it seems to be that this idea that there is this absolute that splits into multiplicity is, you find it all the way through, even into these present day physics examples that, you know, the Wheeler I mentioned last week is a, a sort of more, a recent version of this really, really old idea. And it's amazing how close the discussions are once you get them, once you boil them down to their details. It's the same thing for three, four, 5,000 years. <laughs> we don't really get beyond um, this basic idea of the absolute. Mm -hmm. And in more, in sort of a, a lot of the work, as philosophy goes down a certain path and it um, becomes institutionalized, yeah. this kind of topic about why there's something rather than nothing mm -hmm. gets taken into things like the secret societies and the mm -hmm. Rosicrucians and the Theosophists and um, the Freemasons, and they're the only ones that are dealing with it. So I've been reading all sorts of really kind of bizarre books lately um, that are dealing with this this topic, and and the kind of the only books that deal with it in recent, uh, explicitly in recent years, actually. So that's been quite a good fun project. So what what, what are they saying? And uh, yeah, because it'll be nice to combine. Because if it's uh, beyond explanation, then all explanation matters. Um, if it's um, so, so, yeah, it's beyond um, it's beyond conceptual conceptualization, and it sort of it fits into a whole bunch of other um, things such as mu uh, music. So one of the um, there was a big debate in the eighteen hundreds about absolute music, and it was called absolute music because it didn't have anything other than just pure music, no words or anything. And the idea was that it still had some kind of meaning to it. It was still meaningful. And the idea was it was sort of lower in uh, conceptual in the conceptual hierarchy. So you were getting closer to the absolute. Mm -hmm. So it's supposed to be giving you some kind of information that you wouldn't otherwise get from ordinary, you know, spoken discourse. Likewise, mathematics and symbols are supposed to sort of get you a little bit closer to understanding without doing this split mm. between subjects and object. Mm. Mm. And I suppose mystical experiences would be another example as well, where you're sort of trying to get as close as possible mm. to the nature of the this absolute thing um, without doing the split and making it into an object. Yes, I, I know what you're saying. It's essentially basically chipping off what you don't need. So you don't need this. You don't need this. You don't need this. And what we, the whole attempt being to try to get to the essence of things. And still, it is the essence of something. And mm -hmm. uh, maybe you will always end up getting a representation only. You'll get maybe a very filtered, refined, pure, or whatever you want to call it. But do you think it will always remain a picture of a thing? Exactly. A representation is is the right way. Yeah, exactly. The right way of doing it. So, but that's the knowledge game. So the knowledge game always requires that you set up some representation that's going to be functioning as your explanation or as knowledge, which is set against the thing that you're trying to understand. So I think probably meditation get tries to get around that a little bit or um, sort of spiritual practices, try and get around it a bit because there you're not knowing. Like the, the game is not the knowledge game in that case. The game is to immerse or become one with this thing. So you're not trying to split yourself off from it and understand it and know it. You're just trying to be it, basically. Yes. So I think if, you, if there's any possibility of um, 
but you're not really making sense of it because it's not an experiencer and the experience in that case or the knower and the known it's right. something yeah they end up saying open. yes you end up imbibing it it's and uh, you, you're not able to explain it through words but somehow you imbibe it and it becomes so personal that the moment you start sharing what you've experienced it just loses this uh, the really mm. mm, i don't know the delicate touch or something like for example mm -hmm. we just spoke to one uh, the, the 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 recent uh, the last video that i uploaded was uh, my conversation with an indian uh, physicist uh, he's interested in string theory quantum gravity his name is uh, professor rajesh gopakumar right and uh, i asked him this that that is there a way that Indians look at physics or they enter or approach physics and the non-Indians, Westerners, right? They approach physics. And he said that, yes, Indians seem to have this broader perspective of things and we're looking for meaning. We're looking for the meaning of, of, of things. While a lot of Westerners, uh, they are uh, they like the handy, they like to make things. They're inventors, they're creators. So they're looking at physics as something that allows them to expand that part of their personality, that part of their, you know, uh, creative essence or whatever so yeah so there is the yeah so the approach then also defines you know your reason for entering something defines probably what you get out of it yeah i mean that would be quite a nice um project i would think how um these other features influence the kind of physics that gets done i would imagine i mean you see it in chinese um chinese physics as well chinese physicists have a very particular way of um thinking about their, their physics and you can find um, elements of the I Ching and, and whatnot that sort of somehow are filtering through into the way, certainly the way they present the physics. But Indian physicists, are, are, I find, are, are often concerned with um, unification mm. and unifying theories. Mm. So um, a lot of the earliest approaches to unified field theories um, uh, were carried out in India, there was there were famous workshops that were happening in um, in India before they were happening on a widespread scale elsewhere, actually. So there what, must be what something. Time? What time? This will be the 80s, late 70s and 80s. Hmm. And, the, and you've got um, Salam, Abdus Salam, who's um, Abdul Kalam. Was sort of heavily yeah. Yeah, pushing yeah. towards this kind of unified way, all the forces are unified into one um one single thing and they sort of split through these sort of, sort of symmetry breaking duality kind of um um ideas so it's kind of very um it's sort of close to indian philosophy i think i understand so what you're you saying. Could, it's a, bit mm. a leap but the connections can be made i think yeah yeah and also it's like something intuitive which you do not let go of you know maybe you'll spend a lifetime trying to look for ways to explain it and maybe at the end of it you might have like three words to say or still nothing to say about it but that seems to be the the, the quest for the lack for better word like another film there uh, uh, have you you've heard of this film called uh, guardians of the galaxy so it's a fairly recent film uh, heard of it. Yeah, yeah. right mm -hmm. uh, have you seen the second part yeah, yeah. the second part do you remember the second part i've not seen it. i'll set the context okay i know no the, I've heard of it. Yeah. okay okay so there is this uh, kurt russell's character uh, so he's playing something called ego. Okay. Now ego, he, and he takes uh, uh, the whole group and the audience, of course, along with it through his process of evolution. So he says in the beginning, so he's a, he's a, he's a mini celestial being. He's not God with it. You know, he's, he's a celestial being part of the whole thing. It's not the whole thing. So he's explaining something that he was in the beginning and they're showing it um, visually in this way that they show a single brain like like how the human brain is a brain like that which is kind of throbbing so said i was in the beginning i was utterly alone i was utterly alone slowly i learned uh, so first he realized that he's alone second he realized that he had the power to pull things around him and turn them into a mass of something so that it's not just scattered molecules here and there they kind of can uh, are coming together and taking a shape so from utterly alone, which can be interpreted as maybe formless, and then slowly attracting all these things and putting them into a mask. And then he uh, gave himself a human form, the, the, uh, what we have today, and then set out to look for meaning. And for him, meaning came from his faith in the, in the idea that there are others like him, that there is intelligent life out there. And then he meets and then he finds meaning. Of course, his is a totally, and he's called ego. 
Mm-hmm. That's the interesting part. The character, the name of the character that he's given himself, being a celestial being, is Eco. So, but uh, this is pretty much in the same line. So, uh, you know, cultures are borrowing ideas from here and there. I think now with internet, that borrowing and the interaction and uh, the, the, the might speed up, might go up. So yeah, this was also quite interesting. That in the search of meaning, then wh- how he defined meaning in that film, how they defined meaning was when you connect with others, when you find others like yourself. That's. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's that's almost. I mean, it's very related to the ancient Egyptian ideas that, and the Aztec ideas. So the uh, Quetzalcoatl has a, a need for other beings to sort of stand in relationship to, and it makes sense, right? It's hard to ha- have meaning as a, a a solitary entity. So, um, so the way um, C. G. Jung puts it is, if there would, there would be no reason for God to create mankind if he already knew how everything was going to go. He needs sort of mankind to offer some sort of re- resistance um, um, to his own actions, sort of to reflect himself back. Otherwise, what, the, the, yeah. otherwise, otherwise the world is just a big giant machine. Right. And you know, the reason why we don't bond with robots or with fake things or with artificial intelligence yet is because there's no there's no resistance they can't reflect us back it's just machine like so there's something that we don't like about mechanism and machine like we need that spark that spark of life so until you know, we're never going to get decent artificial intelligence until we have that spark of life in it i'm not sure that's possible and the spark of life is the is free will basically the ability to do what you don't want it to do so right. I think that's, um, yeah, that's kind of at, at the root of it. Yeah, and I, I, even that that's why conversations end up having a life, right? Like if you are on a roll, for the lack of a better phrase, you know, where we're in a conversation and it seems to have a life and you, at the end of it, you feel like nourished and you feel like, yeah, that something happened, like phenomena, like that time we were talking about phenomena. There's something, so there's this weird correlation I'm making. I'm totally going to go out of my element. But last time when we yeah. spoke, you spoke about something called preparation, the outcome, and in the middle there is a phenomena which is the fuzzy case, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Great. Yeah. Then of course in your book you talk about time, as we all know. There's a past, there's a future, and there is the present. And the presence is essentially the fuzzy place again. I mean, it can we can talk about what we mean by fuzzy, what's uncertain, what's going to happen, right? Uh, or it's it's longevity, like it's gone gone like i don't know then you also talk about uh, this uh, this three way split in terms of life there is pre prenatal or what you call pre life uh, before life right and then there is life itself and then there is after life so this uh, and and life is again where we are right life is again where we are and uh, so in some sense it is also fuzzy so just seeing these three things and this pairs of three working out in terms of time uh, in terms of life, in terms of uh, um, like yeah, time itself, like past, present, future, and in terms of how uh, uh, work is done in physics, for example, that there is first a preparation for an experiment, then the phenomena takes place, and then there is an outcome. So is there something, if there is something here, if there is something, like I said, I'm totally out of my element, I'm just taking the leap of imagination, then these three things that fall into the middle realm in that in the line, the yin yang line, the middle path, for so to speak, is there something that they can feed into each other about each other? So can the can present tell us something about the phenomena? Can phenomena tell us something about life? Um, so I don't. I suppose the sort of the connecting thread would be that the fuzzy bit is what's required for creation to happen. That's what enables you not to have a machine or a deterministic. Um, clockwork universe. So I think again, that's why um, this. You mentioned this Guardians of the Galaxy situation. That's why you need the extra things because otherwise there's no creation. There's no novelty in a world. And imagine a world. How dreary a world would be with no novelty or creation, where you know exactly what's going to happen before it's happened. So if you don't have that fuzzy bit where you don't know yet because it's uncertain and it's posti- pure possibility, then you don't get creation. So, and that's what's on the, so that's the present moment. And that's the sort of the bit in between 
the preparation and the phenomenon, right? You don't know what's going to happen yet. None of us do, not even a creator would. And that's why the creator needs this, um, needs us as well to sort of almost kind of assist with this little final creative bit that makes things objective and brings things sort of makes things happen essentially makes events happen so do you so think the fuzzy this, bit yeah sorry you go no so go. do you think this is the then this fuzzy bit this uncertainty which is kind of woven into this it seems to be a part of it is it if that is what it is that this is what essentially is the cause for this uh, anxiety that we sometimes cannot explain like they call it psychic anxiety or whatever it is they call it because the uncertainty is so in it sometimes we mm -hmm. might turn our back to it some might we, we might have moments when things seem to fall in place and then you know wh where is uncertainty there but still something that because it's a it's, it's an essence of this thing that we are a part of because that's how it, it turned out to be yeah um so that so that uncertainty um so i, I mentioned in in the book um the, this business of the midlife crisis is a yeah. sort of situation where that uncertainty becomes sort of anxiety provoking because you're you're aware that um there are your there are possibilities and that you are going to be forced to make a choice so you're going to have to narrow the uncertainties and what's so anxiety provoking about it is that you know because you've got because your amount time. of time is it's getting a lot smaller and smaller and smaller. Mm -hmm. Any choices you make are going to be irreversible. Mm -hmm. So they become more and more serious. Mm -hmm. So you have anxiety from the fact that there's uncertainty and you need to make a choice and you can't keep everything open. But the anxiety is also intensified by the fact that whatever you choose now, as you get older, is going to be permanent, probably. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you choose to do a certain thing, if you choose to move in, with somebody if you choose to get married it's mm. sort of very hard to get um to reverse it or, or stop it the older you get mm. so your choices become take on more magnitude mm. because you're slicing out this is what i mean by the meaning you're slicing out entire possible ways the world could be right right so there's all these so the anxiety is that there are ways the world could be mm. and you have to choose one and if you don't, it's meaningless anyway, because it's a provisional life. You're not choosing anything. You're not anything, really. You haven't sort of determined who you are. But then in choosing it, there's anxiety because it's a courageous act because you're eliminating and pruning all of these other possibilities. So that's where the meaning is, in, um, according to that book. That, right, right. I understand that. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just to stay here a little bit so i've been thinking about time for for um, for a little while now and i thought like right now when we are speaking right uh, a lot of things are happening as we are speaking so in the whole world they're happening at different places but they're happening at the same time now correct me if i'm wrong in my whatever it is that i'm trying to get to so when i thought of it this way then time just took on this, uh, 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 this, this infinite elastic thing, uh, like characteristic to it, like uh, very accommodating because so many things are happening at the same time. They're happening in Australia, in India, they're happening in India, they're happening in my house, outside my house. So many things at different places in time on earth, let's say, okay, let's just our planet. So many things are happening in our world, in plant world and animal world and, you know, uh, all of that, but they're happening at the same time. Whatever is happening right now is happening right now. So does that make time like a something dense as if it's a container? Does it make it something very dense and elastic? I mean, so it's quite difficult to, so the idea of happening at the same time, mm. it's something in physics that has been sort of, um, it's, it's sort of in conflict with special relativity, with Einstein's theory of special relativity. There's no such thing as just happening at the same time. So if I click my fingers, there's no sense of it being at the same time as something happening in Alpha Centauri. We can't say now in some sense where it goes through the entire universe at once. 
you you have to relativize it in physics to a frame of reference so our frame of reference at the moment is provided by this this communications channel mm -hmm. right so we have we're, we're sharing the same frame of reference because we're linked by some um channel of communication mm -hmm. um so you always have to specify the relationship between the things that you are saying are simultaneous because what is simultaneous what's at the same time will depend on how you are traveling and your state of motion and they will differ depending on your state of motion so it's um yeah. it's one of those it's one of those old it's one of those things that people took for granted in newton's day for example that there is a present moment that goes through the entire universe and we all agree on it that's the thing that was killed by einstein's special relativity and he said that doesn't make sense the notion of one single now everywhere that we all agree on doesn't exist in physics okay that's interesting yeah and that's where this business of the light cone comes from he has this, this that's why he's got space time rather than space and time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I, I get it motion comes in i mean i get what you're saying and then this 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 thing that it's happening at the same time also changes yeah it makes sense okay so um there, there is this phrase right called the thought experiment now we're shifting uh gears is there something you'd like to say okay so just, just on that yes and it relates to the fact that i mean you've just said thought experiment so one of the most fa famous thought experiments mm -hmm. um demonstrates exactly this business of the relativity of of now and the idea is that okay so you, you imagine that you're on a train mm. um and at the um front of the carriage and the rear of the carriage somebody um puts off um, a firecracker a firework and you're in the middle now as you're in the train they're going to happen at the same time because they're in your reference frame and you're all moving together on the same carriage if somebody is standing on the platform they are going to see it as the one at the front first and then the other one they're not going to be simultaneous events so it depends on your state of motion how you are moving what mm -hmm. reference frame you're in the ordering of events whether mm -hmm. things are simultaneous or one and then the other mm -hmm. so that's sort of that's the, like the very basic way of explaining that okay. phenomenon that there is no single now. I understood that. You know. Okay, yeah. all right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, I, I understood it when you explained it in terms of motion, in terms of distance. So, yeah, what I wanted to ask you, like I said, shifting gears a little bit. So when I heard the, I don't know when I first heard this phrase, thought experiment, but I know that I heard it in uh, terms of that Einstein used to conduct a lot of thought experiments. Now I want to know mm -hmm. from you, what is the difference between a thought and a thought experiment? a thought and a thought experiment um a thought experiment still has to use basic principles of physics and and reality it's sort of based on general principles of reality mm -hmm. so um so his most famous um thought experiment the one you're referring to is probably the elevator experiment mm -hmm. and it's supposed to show that you can't distinguish between gravitation right yeah. the force that's put pinning you on the floor mm. and acceleration. Mm. And then the idea is he says, okay, so you imagine, and this is the thought experiment, imagine you're in an elevator mm. and you can't see outside the elevator. Mm. Um, now imagine that the elevator is going up and you'll feel a little force on the bottom of your feet, right? So, and you can do this in your head, right? This is, and then he says, okay, now, so there's, you can sort of imagine feeling a force on your feet. And then he says, okay, now imagine that you are in deep space. Mm. There's no gravitational field because there's mm. no objects. Mm. But now imagine there's a rocket attached to the elevator that you're still in. Mm. So you're just in the same elevator box, mm. but you're in deep space and there's a rocket and the rocket mm. um, accelerates mm. ahead. You're gonna get the same feeling in your feet. Mm. It's gonna feel exactly the same, whether you're on the surface of the earth whether you're being uh, moved in an elevator at a certain speed or whether you're being pulled by a rocket at, a, at the same kind of speed as the strength of gravity, mm. you would not be able to distinguish. Mm -hmm. and, and then you extrapolate and you say, now imagine doing experiments in that thing and you're, you know, you're shining beams of light and everything. 
Hmm. All of the same phenomena would be replicated, whether you were in a gravitational field in an elevator um, or whether you were being pulled by the rocket. Mm -hmm. It would just look exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And you can sort of go, you can go through it in your head. Yeah. And you're, and you're using reality to mm. test it. Mm. Right? Mm. You're on what you've experienced in your life. You know what it feels like mm. to have the, you know, the, the floor pushing against your feet. Mm. And then you're being asked to replicate it. So basically, and, and it, yeah, yeah. Well, I was going to say, and it's sort of hard to deny it. The thing about thought experiments is they're supposed to be almost more like mathematical proofs than experiments than physical experiments you know, they're supposed to be undeniable mm -hmm. you're just you're sort of led by a kind of logic that you can't deny it so 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 uh, when you say you can't deny it means they're they're universal in their in their logic like anybody who's it's been so, on an elevator at least would know it yeah there's something that that goes beyond mere sort of experiments in a lab it sort of transcends it almost Right. So how can we take advantage of this? Like, th that's why I'm asking this question, because I am I'm not in the lab. I'm not doing physics. Right. I'm but I'm going about my day. So how do I take advantage of this for me? See, because when you tell me about this thought experiment, uh, there is visual involved, uh, a visual that mm -hmm. I can relate to. Right. When you say firecracker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know what you're trying to say, you know, and uh, so that makes it easy. And you know that a thought has preceded this thought experiment. There's something that has been understood by the mind. And then the mind is using an experiment, a visual cue, you know, so to speak. Right. In order to explain and also justify what perhaps it is grasped intuitively. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you conduct like like in the lab, you conduct some experiments to 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 come up with an verify. equation, right, to verify it. Yeah, exactly. So like in life, we can do this, right, because it, it probably um, um, gives you a hierarchy, isn't it, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of how your idea is proceeding and how it might, uh, where it might come in it. So how can I, as a just a regular person, use the thought experiment idea and make it a part of my life and and, and come up with with, with 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 ways to explain myself better is that that's essentially what i'm trying to get to yeah i don't mm, i don't know i mean so i i mean einstein had a specific problem that he was trying to resolve remember and it was hard because of the phenomena involved mm -hmm. which are imp the reason usually the reason you do thought experiments is because it's too hard to do real experiments you just mm. can't quite create the conditions required so if you if you're doing it in your ordinary life well if you can't an ordinary experiment is usually better because reality can sometimes do things we that our brains you know our brains can be in error so an ordinary experiment doing it in reality would always be preferable so you would use a thought experiment when you can't for whatever reason practical ethical something like that you can't do it and it's basically just isolating what you think the core general principles of your problem are. In the case of Einstein's experiments, it's basically just he's looking at invariance between um, gravitation and acceleration. And he already had the idea that they might be equivalent, acceleration and gravity, and that they should be equivalent, more to the point, in order to make his relativistic view of reality work. So he's sort of coming up with some way of of um justify of i don't know of encoding what he already believed to be the case yeah so so those principles that you spoke about for 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 us when you're doing this in life say those principles are probably our beliefs our emotions yeah right yeah. so like when i thought of the when i hear the word thought experiment the phrase thought experiment i always thought it is about thinking something through like, yeah, 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 sure. It's come from Einstein and the famous for this thought experiment, that thought experiment, maybe mathematicians have done it, maybe linguists do it, maybe, you know, biologists do it, you know, but I thought it always in the sense of thinking a thought through, you're experimenting with scenarios, you're experimenting with your own behavior, and you might just totally falter, you know, uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's why, you know, sometimes I feel like, um, for instance, before every interview, I need to get into some place. And I know when that place is not there. And sometimes I find it mm. on my way during the interview, but 
And this is another thing that Mr. Joseph Campbell, who we also spoke about him in our last interview, it's something that he also said that uh, uh, athletes and, and, and dancers and, and, and maybe, maybe even your wife might have this. Maybe you have this, right? Mm -hmm. Like to, to get into the space where you, you know something is about to start. And before that, you get into a mental space. And I always thought that to be like, a, it's a place of silence or is it a place of thought experiment? Or you're putting all these things together and just, just, just taking yourself out in, into the world with them and seeing how it plays out. That's what I thought. I think that, I don't know. I think that sounds more like... Um visualization and imagination there's the the specific thing about they're related of course but the specific thing about thought experiments is that they're based on principles of science as well mm -hmm. they have to be based on agreed upon principles of science whereas in the case of of these you know where the gymnast imagines doing the triple selco move or whatever in the head first and that's 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 sort of visualization and we know that when you visualize something it activates the particular motor areas that will be sort of used in reality so it's almost like a simulation i would call that more of a simulation projection simulation a, a mental simulation yeah 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 then a thought experiment you're not experimenting on with principles you're going through it you're rehearsing or simulating or something like that interesting interesting you and think, it's not so much yeah. that it's not so much that you're you're dealing with abstract principles you're trying to um get the as much of the reality in your head and in your imagination as you possibly can to prepare for something whereas in the case of thought experiments you're doing the exact opposite actually you're abstracting as much away yeah. from reality to get at the essentials as you can right Thank you, thank you, uh, Professor Rickles. That was really interesting. So now, um, do you think that whether you're studying time, whether you're studying causality, whether you're studying, you know, reality, whatever it is that you're studying, and in um, that, the f the deeper you go into your understanding, you're exploring, you're uncovering, discovering that somewhere there is a chance for us to lose an intuitive grasp on things that way and that there's something to uh, that, that that happens and it's good or bad we're not talking about that but that it happens do you think have you experienced anything like this oh yeah all the time yeah actually <laughs> yeah i it's um sort of the it's this wandering mazes lost phenomenon so from that same bit that i mentioned this william james discussion he also talks about this thing called ontological wonder sickness which is kind of like where reality um kind of breaks down a bit you're probing so deeply into things that mm. it sort of looks it starts to look illusory illusory and you very much get this veil of my th um thing going on especially when you're looking at the at it from the point of view of um it not being real anyway like, so this idea of there being a fundamental absolute um, unconditioned reality if that's the case then everything that emerges from it is somehow not quite real in the same way it is sort of illusory it's coming it's coming from so, from a way of the real things manifesting itself into into pieces into parts and things i don't know if quite that's what we, what you were referring to but i mean certainly yeah there's um it's sort of the the philosopher's curse is that you can sort of lose um, intuitive reality very quickly. This is why you can't be a 24 hours a day philosopher, I think. Okay. And now that you've been doing this work for, 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 for a long time now, and since physics is about, uh, you know, it's a hard science and it's about uh, making judgments and uh, it's evidence based and all of that can you give us some uh, insights that you have gained on how to keep personal biases away in your own life in the sense what i'm asking is yeah this specifically this and then generally as a whole how has your work influenced your outlook uh, 
when you know when you're at home when you're doing your thing but first to fo foremost because a lot of thing a lot of times we end up faltering because of uh we, we get we say we get too emotional we don't want a thing to be true and so we decide it isn't and it comes and you know bite, bites us back it happens but as a physicist you can't afford to do that because you might not like it and even though we spoke about beliefs earlier that it could lead us in a certain direction but still it's justifying something so what what is it that you've learned about it uh so this is why so i think um philosophy is good for scientists for precisely this reason mm. so as i mentioned earlier there with quantum mechanics but it applies all over the place mm. in science but with quantum mechanics there are lots of different ways of interpreting one and the same thing one and the same set of evidence one and the same mathematics that means that you can't be overly confident about your pictures of reality that you're drawing from things mm. so we're all always drawing project drawing pictures of reality but you have to accept there's a whole bunch of projections that aren't necessarily in the data and somebody else is going to have completely different picture and projection onto that reality so and this is the standard one of the standard topics of philosophers of science it's called the problem of underdetermination i.e evidence can not fully determine reality the picture of reality so there's always going to be creeping bias that is forcing that is pushing people to accept some particular picture of reality that is not necessarily true so if you're doing so if you're doing this kind of philosophy you're always on the lookout for um ultimate truths which are obviously independent of bias so that it's at the core of philosophy that you're always trying to eliminate these mm. kinds of things mm. or it should be mm. so it's like you're sort of being trained constantly to do that doesn't mean that you're not going to have bias because you know we're still human and everything so but R is human i totally get it but but still like uh, if there are some tips to keep these biases away as much as you can because it, it in physics you've learned that it works to do it that way well i mean that would be the as i sort of just mentioned that it's if if there are if you can be wrong or disagree in something so apparently fundamental as physics and a mathemat and mathematics then obviously you can be as in error or um, subject to some sort of systematic um, projection from your own beliefs mm. elsewhere right if it's if you can <laughs> If you can have that sort of systematic error in physics, it can happen anywhere. Why not? <laughs> Every, everywhere else, yeah. So I don't know how you actually eliminate them, but you can certainly, it's easy to be aware of them if you can see how easy they arise in something um, that's supposed to be rigorous. So, yeah, can I ask you great. one last question and we'll just wrap it up? So, one last question. The, have you seen the film 2001 uh, Space Odyssey? Of course, yeah. Yeah. What do you think the model was? I actually, I actually just watched it um, again. Yeah. Uh, last week. Yeah. <clears throat> what do you think the monolith was? What's the monolith. I don't know. It's an an entity to advance evolution by giving it some kind of um, uh, enlightenment. It's sort of a something that is delivering a next phase of evolution to mankind by making it more aware yeah. of things like the uh, like the illusions for example it's like a, a a tool of awakening a great awakening bot what what do you think the monolith is yes yeah, see it just for me uh, what i do is i see when it appears so every time mm -hmm. it appears something happens so the first time it appears among the amongst the chimps, right? They see it as a tool, uh, defense, offense, and they, uh, uh, you know, they acquire more resources because now the water hole is theirs. And then these are the guys who then advance to the next stage of evolution, and which is immediately we're going to moon, we're going to, you know, somewhere else. So I see it as as as, as a marker, as a marker. Here you've come this far, and uh, also it's like. Uh, in the film or because they show that the monolith is here and so the change happens immediately 
I don't know. Like maybe it's it had been there, but perhaps in some sense when we were ready to, in some sense ready to uh, evolve to the next step, whatever it might be, we, we begin to see it. It uh, transforms us, rearranges the way we think, and uh, there is a there's a change that happens. So I see it as a marker, when it w w mm -hmm. which you are able to see when you are ready to see it. So that's why there are yeah. markers before. So for the man to go on the moon, there was a marker that uh, that the chimps had to see. So that had to come over. So I see it as a matter of time that it's here. There is going to be a change. And when the change happens, mm -hmm. when the, you're ready for the change to happen, you'll see the marker and you'll, you'll wonder. And maybe wonder would be a good place to start. So, I mean, I can, I'll walk down many, many <laughs> different ways. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and then in the end, when uh, what are your thoughts on how it ends? The film, the way the film ends when it turns into this strange, large, bulbous fetus. Yeah, well, that's the starseed scene, of course, where he's reborn. Socket, yeah. Yeah. Um, into again another phase of evolution. So he's been advanced again. So each time that monolith appears, there is a, a leap, hmm. a massive leap in yeah. the evolution of man of humanity or consciousness. And I think you're right. I mean, what the way you suggested it, hmm. it sounds like initiation, rites of initiation. And there are certain phases that you go through. And when you're ready, you will be illuminated. And then you will see certain things and the veils will fall away and these kinds of things. Sounds very Campbell-esque again, actually, how it you put it. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you never know, like, what influences uh, what we speak. Because I cannot own everything I'm saying. And there's no point in it anyway, right? Mm -hmm. Because there's, because my husband and I, both of us, we have exposed ourselves to certain kind of people, and certain kinds of but there is something that has drawn us to them and not to someone else you know so mm -hmm. that also says something so uh i use films a lot. Huh? i think there might be a monolith that's landed somewhere you think yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah we wouldn't know if it sat on our face right now like what would it look like <laughs> okay i think uh but you think so i don't well there seems to be something going on See, that's because another way. Wa that's amazing. So you're not waiting for something to show up. We've decided that when something changes is when something shows up. The monolith comes when we're ready. So because we, you're feeling that change in us, that's what's making you say that <laughs> a mm -hmm. monolith is there to be described. Right, right, right. right. Yeah, so uh, any last words for, for this part? Not really. It was very enjoyable, though. <laughs> Good oh, questions. One of my questions to you was, which I won't have the time to get into, but I'll ask it anyway, is what kind of questions, as a philosopher of physics, what kind of questions do you like to get asked? And what kind of questions do you get asked? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's usually something boring about quantum mechanics. I don't even consider myself to be a philosopher of physics much anymore. It's, I don't know what it is these days, but it's something not quite philosophy of physics, that's for sure. It's underneath philosophy of physics, metaphysics, I don't know, something else. Yeah. Okay. But it was fun. Yes, it was so much fun. And uh, it was uh, also, there was there were so many things that I've picked up, uh, uh, Professor Rickles, from uh, both these conversations, these two-part conversations that I've had with you. Very useful. And uh, I just wish you all the best and all the luck with this, whatever it is that you're looking for. <laughs> Likewise. And thank you. Thank you so much.